FL Studio One was created on December 18th, 1997. Apparently at 5.39 p.m. by a lone Belgian developer named Didier Dambrin. FL1 looked rough. I mean, just look at this thing. It was the ugly duckling of software. It wasn't even ever officially released. Despite not ever having an official release, the software became so popular it overwhelmed ImageLine's servers from the number of downloads, prompting them to make FL Studio into a full DAW. You heard me correctly. FL1 was not even a full DAW. It was a MIDI only, and essentially just a drum machine. Other than the interface, I can't find much information on this version. It received small updates during 98 and 99, like bug fixes, UI changes, and performance enhancements. It kept receiving small updates like that for a while, that is, until FL2 arrived. FL Studio 2 was the first iteration of FL that looks somewhat like what we have today. It is quite impressive what was possible with FL2, considering it was released in late 1999. The splash art is nostalgic and feels like it came straight out of GeoCities. It added revolutionary things for the time like DirectX plugins, the ability to render 32-bit WAV files, and MIDI input. You could even do live recordings into FL directly. If you think about it compared to today, those things are extremely simple, but think back to 1999. Star Wars Episode 1 had just come out. We still didn't even have Windows XP, and people thought that Y2K was going to be the end of the world. All things considered, I think FL2 was ahead of its time. However, that's nothing compared to what was coming next. On January 25th, 2001, version 3 was launched. With FL Studio 3, it was starting to become possible to create real, professional music with the software. It added the most important features that we still use today, like the piano roll, effect sends, full MIDI support, and of course, the infamous 3x OSC VST. It even had a primitive mixer back in 2001, which was called the FX window. Granted, it was a bit limited compared to today's mixer, but still. 3.0 continued the trend of adding more complex features and plugins, like saving piano roll presets, fruity LSD, ASIO output support, the Stereo Enhancer plugin, and Fruity Delay 2. Stereo enhancers are used to widen sounds and make it feel like they're further left or right in your ears, while delay plugins are used to repeat sounds multiple times that decay in volume over time. At this stage, FL was still becoming established and had a lot of bumps in the road, two of which were on the horizon for the release of FL4. In 2003, ImageLine applied for the Fruity Loops trademark in the US for the first time. Before this, they only owned the trademark in Europe. However, Kellogg's being the morally dubious company that they are, started releasing CDs and games in their cereal boxes and claimed to already be a part of the software industry. Because ImageLine was still a relatively new and a small company, and they didn't want to be in a costly court battle for years, they decided to scrap the name Fruity Loops and officially change their software to FL Studio. On top of this, ImageLine was struggling to get sales and were begging people to host their demo on their servers just to get it in front of people. They even had a customer at one point almost lose a contract because at the time, the loops part of their name signified that their software was used for pre-canned loops and not real music production. The customer's label found out that they were using FL Studio and thought they were using these loops. It seemed pretty bad for them, but only good things were coming for ImageLine in the near future. FL Studio 4 was big. They added a fully fledged mixer with 64 inserts, side chaining and routing for the mixer inserts, a clean new playlist design, and the ability to record directly to your hard disk. Along the way, they added new plugins like Boobase and Citrus while continuing to polish FL. Version 5 was released on November 22nd, 2004. To me, it seemed like a pretty low-key release, following their trend of fixing bugs and slowly adding new and improved features to the software. The same can be said for 6.0. Love Filter was added along with DirectWave, which are two plugins that we still use to this day. It seemed like ImageLine was slowly but silently growing their brand and were on the verge of establishing FL Studio as one of the giants in the music production industry. The best of FL Studio was yet to come. 7.0 was released on January 30th, 2007, one of the largest updates to the software yet. The GUI was redesigned completely and was looking more and more like what we have today. Edison, probably one of the most used plugins in FL, was also added. Edison is just a more advanced form of Audacity. 
Along with Edison came one of the simplest yet most recognizable plugins in FL Studio, Parametric EQ2. It was smooth, responsive, and had a look like no other EQ. EQs or equalizers are used to boost or dampen specific frequencies across the audio spectrum. FL Studio was coming into its own by 7.0. Many of the core features we still use were being added and refined. It would only be a few years until FL Studio would explode into the mainstream of music production and become a dominant force. It's been 10 years since FL Studio was first released. February 9th, 2008, FL 8.0 launches. These were wild times. The MCU was about to unfold, the Great Recession was in full swing, and Bertie Madoff was finally arrested. Meanwhile, ImageLine quietly worked away and continued to slowly upgrade FL Studio. This version was more the same that we saw from 7.0, except with a host of performance improvements, bug fixes, and big visual updates. This would be the last version to opt for using the pattern block system. It also marked a time in FL Studio's history where they started to really get into the philosophy of users being able to do things the way that they wanted to. It's common in FL Studio to have three, four, or even five different ways of doing the same thing. ImageLine wanted their software to be modular and mold to the person using it, which was not common at all at the time. On top of this, ImageLine believes in lifetime updates, so anyone who purchases any version of FL Studio will be able to update to the most current version for free at any time. I think this is what makes FL special. Sure, it has its issues, but it's the everyman's DAW. It works for you and not the other way around. With 9.0 around the corner, things are about to get even better for ImageLine. With the release of 9.0 on September 9th, 2009, the free-flowing version of the playlist was finally center stage. This is the FL Studio we know and love today, albeit a little bit less functional. This style of playlist was now the main way to arrange your music. You could put MIDI patterns, WAV files, and automation in the same area, and the pattern block system was discarded. Customization was front and center with grouping, colorizing, and icons on each track. Speaking of the software that we all know and love today, let's talk about Growspeed. This was a completely revolutionary plugin exclusive to FL Studio. It was released alongside 9.0 and changed the way beats were made. Think about all the producers who swear by Growspeed. It's probably the most talked about plugin when people are talking about FL Studio. I personally can't imagine making music without this thing. It truly was a landmark moment for ImageLine. We also received Vocodex, which is a widely used vocoder plugin. Think a digital version of a talk box like Daft Punk uses. During 2009 and 2010, FL Studio continued to expand its reach and building its stock plugin list with VSTs like Harmless, Convolver, and Sakura. It was at this point in time that FL Studio asserted itself directly into the middle of the competition for DAWs. It was building Steam and it was a real competitor to Logic and Ableton Live. Still, even more good things were to come for ImageLine in the future. The date is March 29th, 2011. FL Studio has been getting a record number of updates. 10.0 is finally released. At this point, ImageLine has been doing reveal videos for new versions of FL Studio, highlighting the best new features and changes on YouTube. This was a very smart move in my opinion. It got FL in front of a new generation of eyes on the internet. In 2011, YouTube was still young, so it was not yet common for companies to have official company YouTube channels. The FL Studio hype is in full effect. Vila and Seamless had a demo track that came with the purchase of FL Studio that utilized a bunch of features to show up how far the software had come. Tons of visual updates optimizing the interface and making it look better came in such as waveform view, plugin delay compensation, support for 64-bit plugins, and a huge playlist changes, like making unique samples and resizing the individual tracks or all of them at once. On top of that, the piano roll got a massive makeover. It now had the ability to add properties to individual notes, a waveform view, multi-hotkey viewing options, editable ghost notes, and exporting your piano roll into a music score sheet. I think the piano roll is one of the things that people will cite the most when they're asked about why they use FL. Even today, it's the most powerful and easy to use piano roll in the industry, hands down. With all of this added, there was one more feature that is probably the most underused plugin, but also one of the most powerful. In FL10, Patcher was added. This is a plugin that allows you to have complex routing in a large chain of FX and generator plugins. 
On top of that, it's basically a sandbox for you to create your own VSTs within FL Studio. Version 10 was truly the gold standard for ImageLine, and it is the first version of FL Studio to break into the mainstream and be used by producers such as TM88, Metro Boomin, Southside, and Avicii to name a few. After version 10 was released, it was pretty quiet. Some performance and bug fix patches were released over the course of 2011. Other than FL Mobile being released in the summer of 2011, not a single update happened for the PC version during 2012. That is, until 2013 rolled around. On April 22nd, 2013, FL 11 was released, accompanied by a video from ImageLine about the release. It got a slick new icon, which personally I'm not a fan of. I love the fruit. And tons of new plugins were added to the stock collections, such as Effector, New Tone 2, and updates to DirectWave. I think FL 11 was the first iteration of FL that was accessible to a new generation of producers. It was the version I personally started using first, and I think a lot of kids got their start in this version of FL. I think some of the success of version 11 is owed to producers on YouTube who use the software, such as KPZ, Nick Mira, and Bro Beats. At this point in time, FL Studio had made a name for itself. It had almost all the features we use today in FL 20, and it had cemented itself as a piece of software that professionals could use. April 20th, 2015, FL 12 launches. This would be the year of visual changes. FL Studio got a complete overhaul to how it looked. It was brought into the 21st century, in my opinion. It was smooth, colorful, dynamic, and fast. There weren't many new plugins or traditional changes. However, there were still some very important updates. We got a visual representation of mixer routing and side chaining. Every single stock interface was scalable up to 8K, and the playlist and piano roll were visually updated. Although the changes were impressive, a lot of people did end up sticking with 11 because that's what they knew. There were a lot of things moved around in FL12 and people don't like massive change, so it was a struggle to get people to switch over. However, slowly but surely, people ended up realizing that FL12 was so much better and ended up moving over. FL Studio had an amazing collection of stock samples and plugins, a new sleek look, and was a powerhouse in the music production scene. By this time, FL had become the most searched for DAW on Google and was the gold standard for music production. Three years went by with small updates and features added. People were unsure of what was going to happen next. On May 22, 2018, ImageLine announced and launched FL Studio 20, skipping versions 13 to 19 to celebrate the 20th anniversary of FL Studio. At this point, it wasn't clear what was going to be added, as FL already had such a large library of features, but ImageLine never disappoints. Mac support was finally added so people could switch from Logic Pro to FL. The ability to produce in different time signatures was finally possible. Bouncing MIDI into consolidated WAV files could be done on the fly, and you could even have multiple arrangements in a single project by creating multiple playlists. This was truly the version of sweeping changes that allowed people to do things the way they wanted to. ImageLine has stuck to their philosophy of being able to do things your way and continued to sell lifetime free updates for any edition of FL. It's kind of remarkable in a day and age where every company seems to be trying to milk as much money as possible out of their consumers by using a subscription model, ImageLine has never wavered from their promise that you truly do own FL Studio when you buy it, and you will be taken care of for the lifetime of the software. I think FL20 is exactly what ImageLine wanted it to be when they started, and I'm personally excited to see what will come next for them. I wanted to make this video for a few reasons. Firstly, music is something that I'm interested in, and reading about the history of artists, software, labels, and anything else music related is fun for me. Secondly, it is to share that passion with other people and to expose people to the amazing stuff that's out there. I hope to see you guys out there making music no matter what software you use. Who knows, maybe I'll even make some more of these kinds of video essays about other programs, although it's brutal to edit. We'll see. Thank you all for watching.